Uh, let's start chapter number six. That is colonialism and the city, the story of an imperial capital. What happened to cities under colonial rule? You have seen how life in the countryside changed after the establishment of British power. What happened to the cities during the same period? The answer will depend on the kind of town or city we are discussing. The history of a temple town like Madurai will not be the same as that of a manufacturing town like Dhaka or a port like Surat or towns that simultaneously served many different functions. In most parts of the western world, modern cities emerged with industrialization. In Britain, industrial cities like Leeds and Manchester grew rapidly in the 19th and 20th centuries. As more and more people sought jobs, housing and other facilities in these places. However, unlike Western Europe, Indian cities did not expand as rapidly in the 19th century. Why was this so? Figure number one. Uh, it's a view of Machli Patnam, 1672. Machli Patnam developed as an important port town in the 17th century. Its importance declined by the late 18th century as trade shifted to the new British ports of Bombay, Madras and Calcutta. In the late 18th century, Calcutta Bombay and Madras rose in importance as presidency cities. So, presidency means uh, for administrative purposes, colonial India was divided into three presidencies, Bombay, Madras and Bengal, which developed from the East India Company's factories, trading post at Surat, Madras and Calcutta. They became the centers of British power in the different regions of India. At the same time, a host of smaller cities declined. Many towns manufacturing specialized goods declined due to a drop in the demand for what they produced. All trading centers and ports could not survive when the flow of trade moved to new centers. Similarly, earlier centers of regional power collapsed when local rulers were defeated by the British and new centers of administration emerged. This process is often described as de-urbanization. Cities such as Machli Patnam, Surat, and Seranga Patnam were de urbanized during the 19th century. By the early 20th century, only 11% of Indians were living in cities. So, figure number two Bombay poured in the 18th century. The city of Bombay began to grow when the East India Company started using Bombay as its main port in Western India. The historic imperial city of Delhi became a dusty provincial town in the 19th century before it was rebuilt as the capital of British India after 1912. Let us look at the story of Delhi to see what happened to it under colonial rule. So, what's the meaning of urbanization? It means the process by which more and more people begin to reside in towns and cities. How many Delhis before New Delhi? You know Delhi as the capital of modern India. Did you also know that it has been a capital for many, for more than a 1000 years? although with some gaps. As many as 14 capital cities were founded in a small area of about 40 square miles on the left bank of the river Jamuna. 
the remains of all other capitals may be seen on a visit to the modern city state of delhi of these the most important are the capital cities built between the 12th and 17th centuries okay this image this image shows shah jahanabad in the mid 19th century the illustrated london news 16th january 1858 you can see the red fort on the left notice the walls that surround the city through the center runs the main road of jani chok not also the river jamuna is flowing near the red fort today it has shifted course the place where the boat is about to embark is now known as darya ganj darya means river ganj means market the most splendid capital of all was built by shah jahan shah jahanabad was begun in 1639 and consisted of a fort palace complex and the city adjoining it lal qila or the red fort made of red sandstone contained the palace complex to its west lay the walled city with 14 gates the main streets of janni chok and fez bazaar were broad enough for royal processions to pass a canal ran down the center of janni chok set amidst densely packed mohallas and several dozen bazaars the jama masjid was among the largest and grandest mosque in india there was no place higher than this mosque within the city then delhi during shah jahan's time was also an important center of sufi culture it had several dargahs So Darga is the tomb of a Sufi saint. Khankas, a Sufi lodge, often used as a rest house for travelers and a place where people come to discuss spiritual matters, get the blessings of saints, and hear Sufi music. And Idgas, an open prayer place of Muslims, primarily meant for it prayers open squares winding lanes quiet gulde sacks street with a dead end and water channels were the pride of delhi's residents no wonder the poet mir taqi mir said the streets of delhi aren't mere streets they are like the album of a painter So figure number 4 the western gate of the Jama Masjid in Delhi by Thomas Daniel 1795 this is also the first mosque in India with minarets and full domes yet even this was no ideal city and its delights were enjoyed only by some there were sharp divisions between rich and poor havelis or mansions were interspersed with the far more numerous mud houses of the poor the colorful world of poetry and dance was usually enjoyed only by men furthermore celebrations and processions often led to serious conflicts so figure number 5 the shrine of nizamuddin aulia in delhi source number 1 delhi jo ek shahar tha alam mein intikhab by 1739 delhi had been sacked by nadir shah and plundered many times expressing the sorrow of those who witnessed the decline of the city the 18th century urdu poet mir taqi mir said delhi jo ek shahar tha alam mein intikhab हम रहने वाले हैं 
Usi Ujri Dayarke. I belong to the same ruined territory of Delhi, which was once a supreme city in the world. The Making of New Delhi In 1803, so in 1803, the British gained control of Delhi after defeating the Marathas. Since the capital of British India was Calcutta, the Mughal emperor was allowed to continue living in the palace complex in the Red Fort. The modern city as we know it today developed only after 1911 when Delhi became the capital of British India. So, demolishing a past. Before 1857, developments in Delhi were somewhat different from those in other colonial cities. In Madras, Bombay or Calcutta, the living spaces of Indians and the British were sharply separated. Indians lived in the black areas. The black areas while the British lived in well laid out white areas in delhi especially in the first half of the 19th century the british lived along with the wealthier indians in the walled city the british learned to enjoy urdu persian culture and poetry and participated in local festivals the establishment of the delhi college in 1792 led to a great intellectual flowering in the sciences as well as the humanities, largely in the Urdu language. Many refer to the period from 1830 to 1857 as the pre period of the Delhi Renaissance. So, Renaissance, literally rebirth of art and learning, it is a term often used to describe a time when there is great creative activity. All this changed after 1857 during the revolt that year. As you have seen, the rebels gathered in the city and persuaded Badur Shah to become the leader of the uprising, Delhi remained under rebel control for four months. So figure number six, this shows the British forces wreaking vengeance on the streets of Delhi, massacring the rebels. So source two, there was once a city of this name. Ghalib lamented the changes that were occurring and wrote sadly about the past that was lost, he wrote. What can I write? The life of Delhi depends on the fort, Johnny Chalk, the daily gatherings at the Jamuna Bridge and the annual Galfaroshan. It is the festival of flowers. When all these things are no longer there, how can Delhi live? Yes, there was once a city of this name in the dominions of India. Okay. When the British regained the city, they embarked on a campaign of revenge and plunder. The famous poet Ghali witnessed the events of the time. This is how he described the ransacking of Delhi in 1857. When the angry lions, the British, entered the town, they killed the helpless and burned houses. Hordes of men and women, commoners and noblemen poured out of Delhi from the three gates and took shelter in small communities and tombs outside the city. To prevent another rebellion, the British exiled Bahadur Shah to Burma, that's now Myanmar, dismantled his court, raged several of the palaces 
closed down gardens and built barracks for troops in their place. Figure number 7. Looking out from Jama Masjid. Photograph by Fallis Beto. 1858-59 noticed the buildings all around the masjid. They were cleared after the revolt of 1857. The British wanted Delhi to forget its Mughal past. The area around the fort was completely cleared of gardens, pavilions and mosques, though temples were left intact. The British wanted a clear ground for security reasons. Mosques in particular were either destroyed or put to other uses. For instance, the Janet al-Masjid was converted into a bakery. No worship was allowed in the Jama Masjid for five years. One third of the city was demolished and its canals were filled up. In the 1870s, the western walls of Sahajahanabad were broken to establish the railway and to allow the city to expand beyond the walls. The British now began living in the sprawling civil line, lines area that came up in the north, away from the Indians in the walled city. The Delhi College was turned into a school and shut down in 1877. Figure 8 View from the Jama Masjid after the surrounding buildings were demolished. Planning a new capital So, figure 9 The Coronation Darbar of King George V, 12th December 1911, over 100,000 Indian princes and British officers and soldiers gathered at the Darbar. Planning a new capital, the British were fully aware of the symbolic importance of Delhi. After the revolt of 1857, many spectacular events were held there. In, in 1877, Viceroy Lytton organized a darbar to acknowledge organized a darbar to acknowledge Queen Victoria as the Empress of India. Remember that Calcutta was still the capital of British India, but the Grand Darbar was being held in Delhi. Why was this so? During the revolt, the British had realized that the Mughal Emperor was still important to the people and they saw him as their leader. It was therefore important to celebrate British power with pomp and show in the city the Mughal emperors had earlier ruled and the place which had turned into a rebel stronghold in 1857. In 1911, when King George V was crowned in England, a darbar was held in Delhi to celebrate the occasion. The decision to shift the capital of India from Calcutta to Delhi was announced at this darbar. Figure number 10. The Vice Regal Palace, Rastrapati Bhavan, atop Raisina Hill. So, this is the Rastrapati Bhavan. The New Delhi was constructed as a 10 square mile city on Raisina Hill, south of the existing city. Two architects. Edward Lutyens and Herbert Baker were called on to design New Delhi 
and its buildings. The government complex in New Delhi consisted of a two-mile avenue. Kingsway, now Rajpath, that lay to the Viceroy's Palace, now Rastrapati Bhavan, with the Secretariat buildings on either sides of the avenue. The features of these government buildings were borrowed from different periods of India's imperial history, but the overall look was classical Greece, 5th century BCE. For instance, the central dome of the Viceroy's palace was copied from the Buddhist stupa at Sanchi, and the red sandstone and carved screens or jalis were borrowed from Mughal architecture. But the new buildings had to assert British importance. That is why the architect made sure that the Viceroy's palace was higher than Shah Jahan's Jama Masjid. How was this to be done? New Delhi took nearly 20 years to build. The idea was to build a city that was a stark contrast to Shah Jahanabad. There were to be no crowded mohallas, no mazes of narrow violence. In New Delhi, there were to be broad, straight streets lined with sprawling mansions set in the middle of large compounds. The architect wanted New Delhi to represent a sense of law and order, in contrast to the chaos of Old Delhi. The new city also had to be clean and healthy and uh, had to be a clean and healthy space. The British saw overcrowded spaces as unhygienic and unhealthy, the source of disease. This meant that New Delhi had to have better water supply, sewage disposal and drainage facilities than the old city. It had to be green with trees and parks, ensuring fresh air and adequate supply of oxygen. Now source 3. The Vision of New Delhi this is how Viceroy Harding explained the choice of Delhi as capital. The change would strike the imagination of the people of India and would be accepted by all as the assertion of an unfaltering determination to maintain British rule in India. The architect Herbert Becker believed the new capital must be the sculptural monument of the good government and unity which India for the first time in its history has enjoyed under British rule. British rule in India is not a mere veneer of government and culture. It is a new civilization in growth, a blend of the best elements of East and West. It is to this great fact that the architecture of Delhi should bear testimony. 2nd October 1912 Life in the Time of Partition The Partition of India in 1947 led to a massive transfer of population on both sides of the new border. As a result, the population of Delhi swelled. The kinds of jobs people did changed. and the culture of the city became different. Days after Indian independence and partition, fierce rioting began. Thousands of people in Delhi were killed and their homes looted and burned.
As streams of Muslims left Delhi for Pakistan, their place was taken by equally large numbers of Sikh and Hindu refugees from Pakistan. Refugees roamed the streets of Sahajahanabad, searching for empty homes to occupy. At times, they forced Muslims to leave or sell their properties. Over two-thirds of the Delhi Muslims migrated. Migrated. Almost 44,000 homes were abandoned. Terrorized Muslims lived in makeshift camps till they could leave for Pakistan. At the same time, Delhi became a city of refugees. Nearly 500,000 people were added to Delhi's population, which had a little over 800,000 people in 1951. Most of these migrants were from Punjab. They stayed in camps, schools, military barracks and gardens, hoping to build new homes. Some got the opportunity to occupy residences that had been vacated. Others were housed in refugee colonies. New colonies such as Lajpat Nagar and Tilak Nagar came up at this time. Shops and stalls were set up to cater to the demands of the migrants. Schools and colleges were also opened. Figure 11. Thousands stayed in the refugee camps set up in Delhi after partition. The skills and occupations of the refugees were quite different from those of the people they replaced. Many of the Muslims who went to Pakistan were artisans, petty traders and laborers. The new migrants coming to Delhi were rural landlords, lawyers, teachers, traders and small shopkeepers. Partition changed their lives and their occupation. They had to take up new jobs as hawkers, vendors, carpenters and ironsmiths. Many, however, prospered in their new businesses. The large migration from Punjab changed the social milieu of Delhi. The large migration from Punjab changed the social milieu of Delhi and urban culture largely based on Urdu was overshadowed by new taste and sensibilities in food, dress and the arts. Inside the old city Meanwhile, what happened to the old city that had been Sahajahanabad? In the past, Mughal Delhi's famed canals had brought not only fresh drinking water to homes, but also water for other domestic uses. This excellent system of water supply and drainage was neglected in the 19th century. The system of wells or Baulis also broke down and channels to remove household waste called effluents were damaged. This was at a time when the population of the city were, was, consti was continuously growing. And figure number 12, a famous Bauli near the shrine of Nizamuddin Aulia in Delhi. The broken down canals could not serve the needs of this rapidly increasing population. At the end of the 19th century, the Saha Jahani drains were closed and a new system of open surface drains was introduced. This system too was soon overburdened and many of the well there inhabitants complained about the stench from the roadside privies and overflowing 
open drains. The Delhi Municipal Committee was unwilling to spend money on the good drainage system. At the same time, though millions of rupees were being spent on drainage systems in the New Delhi area. Figure number 13. Chandni Chok in Delhi in the late 19th century. The decline of Havelis. The Mughal aristocracy in the 17th and 18th centuries lived in grand mansions called Havelis. A map of the mid-19th century showed at least a hundred such Havelis, which were large walled compounds with mansions, courtyards and fountains. A Haveli housed many families. On entering the Haveli through a beautiful gateway, you reach an open courtyard surrounded by public rooms meant for visitors and business, used exclusively by males. The inner courtyard with its pavilions and rooms was meant for the women of the household. Rooms in the Havelis had multiple uses and very little by way of furniture. Even in the mid-19th century, Kamar al-Din Khan's Haveli had several structures within it and included housing for the cart drivers, tent pitchers, torch bearers as well as for accountants, clerks and household servants. Many of the Mughal emirs, that is a nobleman, were unable to maintain these large establishments under conditions of British rule. Havelis therefore began to be subdivided and sold. Often the street front of the Haveli became shops or warehouses. Some Havelis were taken over by the upcoming mercantile class, but many fell into decay and disuse. The colonial bungalow was quite different from the Haveli. Meant for one nuclear family, it was a large single-storied structure with a pitched roof and usually set in one or two acres of open ground. It had separate living and dining rooms and bedrooms and a white veranda. Figure number 14 a colonial bungalow in New Delhi. So it has a white veranda running in the front and sometimes on three sides. Kitchen, stables and servants' quarters were in a separate space from the main house. The house was run by dozens of servants. The women of the household often sat on the verandas to supervise tailors or other tradesmen. The municipality begins to plan. Figure number 15, a street in Old Delhi. The census of 1931 revealed that the walled city area was horribly crowded with as many as 90 persons per acre, while New Delhi had only about 3 persons per acre. The poor conditions in the walled city, however, did not stop it from expanding. In 1888, an extension scheme called the Lahore Gate Improvement Scheme was planned by Robert Clark for the walled city residents. The idea was to draw... Okay... The idea was to draw residents away from the old city to a new type of market square around which 
shops would be built. Streets in this redevelopment strictly followed the grid pattern and were of identical width, size and character. Land was divided into regular areas for the construction of neighborhoods. Clark Jung Okay, Clark Gunch as the development was called, remained incomplete and did not help to decongest the old city. So it was called Clark Gunch. Even in 1912, water supply and drainage in these new localities was very poor. The Delhi Improvement Trust was set up in 1936 and it built areas like Darya Ganj south for wealthy Indians. Houses were grouped around parks. Within the houses, space was divided according to new rules of privacy. Instead of spaces being shared by many families or groups, now different members of the same family had their own private spaces within the home. So elsewhere in the world, what's happening? Herbert Baker in South Africa. Figure number 16, figure number 17. If you look at figure number 16 and figure number 17, you will find a startling similarity between the buildings. But these buildings are continents apart. What does this show? In the early 1980s, a young English architect named Herbert Baker went to South Africa in search of work. It was in South Africa that Baker came in touch with Cecil Rhodes, the governor of Cape Town who inspired in Baker a love for the British Empire and an admiration for the architectural heritage of ancient Rome and Greece. Figure number 17 shows the union building that Baker designed in the city of Pretoria in South Africa. It used some of the elements of ancient classical architecture that Baker later included in his plans of the Secretariat building in New Delhi. The Union building was also located on a steep hill as is the Secretariat building in New Delhi that is figure number 16. Have you not noticed that people in positions of power want to look down on others from above rather than up towards them from below? The Union building and the Secretariat were both built to house imperial officers. So let's do true or false. So number A, in the Western world, modern cities grew with industrialization. True. Number B, Surat and Machli Patnam developed in the 19th century. False, it declined. In the 20th century, the majority of Indians lived in cities. False. Number D. After 1857, no worship was allowed in the Jama Masjid for five years. It's true. Number E. More money was spent on cleaning Old Delhi than New Delhi. False. So now let's do fill in the bank blanks. Number A. The first structure to successfully use the dome was called the Jama Masjid. The two architects who designed New Delhi and Sahajahanabad were Edward Lutyens and Herbert Becker. Number C. The British so overcrowded spaces as unhygienic and unhealthy. Number D. In 1888, an extension scheme called the Lahore Gate Improvement Scheme was devised.
So that's all guys. See you in my next video. Bye.